ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. Okay, it is Monday, May 6th, 2024, and I'm calling to order night four of Arlington's 2024 annual town meeting. Tonight is budget night at town meeting. We will cover, all right, settle down. We'll cover town budgets, you're a weird crowd, and the capital budget, which are articles 39 and 40. I'll have more to say about the budgets when we get there. In the meantime, please make sure you've found the corrections to the capital planning report. Uh, you'll, it'll be off of the town meeting page if you have an internet connection. Um, Ms. Brazil, do we, have, do we have printouts of that correction? Okay, we don't have printouts, but... Um, yeah, uh, actually, if, if we, can we project the corrections while I give the rest of my remarks? Okay. Okay. On Wednesday, we will take up the special town meeting. There's obviously been a lot of attention on Article 5, the resolution which involves a very challenging subject matter. We're likely to have lots of guests in the gallery that night. There's going to be a lot of potential for heightened emotions. I'll have more to say Wednesday night, but I want, to, I want everyone here now to consider tonight a dress rehearsal for appropriate behavior at town meeting. That means no shouting, no cheering, no applause, no booing. We will act like responsible adults to keep the temperature down. Also, preparations are being made for Wednesday night to ensure safe entry and exit into and out of town hall, and to ensure everyone's safety within the building so that town meeting can do the business that we've been asked to do. For members of the public observing from the gallery, which are in the wings of the balcony, I want to remind you that there is no cheering, no shouting, no applause, no signs, no banners, no waving of flags, and certainly no interruption of speakers. Next, let's talk about terminating debate. I've gotten reports that there's been cheering and high-fiving when someone gets recognized to speak who intends to call for terminating debate. Let's remind everyone that town meeting is not a game. You are not fans in a stadium. You are elected representatives of your precincts and you're expected to act like responsible and respectable adults. When you cheer or gloat, you are breeding bad blood with other town meeting members who disagree with you. And that hurts this institution. And there's another side of this issue. Terminating debate has a legitimate purpose. Less than one third of the meeting does not have the right to hold more than two thirds of the meeting captive to a debate that it does not want. There are numerous opportunities to get answers to questions before you step inside town hall. It's not reasonable to expect that you'll get all the answers you need from casting, uh, uh, an, inform for casting an informed vote sitting in those uncomfortable seats listening to dozens of speakers. And lastly, let's do a quick experiment. If you were born in a year that's an odd number, think what year you were born in, if it's an odd number, say yes. And if you're born in a year that's an even number, say no. no. Good. That's the volume you should use when I call for voice votes. I got a report that when I called for a voice vote last Wednesday, someone's health app on their phone alerted them about a dangerously loud noise that could impair their hearing. They sent me a screenshot. That's not how voice votes are supposed to work. So here's what we're going to do. I'm gonna start tracking how often my call of a voice vote is overruled by an electronic vote. And if I'm wrong too often, which generally happens when people on one side of the debate shout too much, then I'm gonna stop taking voice votes. And we're gonna be here longer than we otherwise would if folks just called out their vote at a reasonable volume. And with that, uh, please rise for the national anthem.
Oh, I also want to remind folks that we have guests tonight in the, uh, the, ba in the side balcony. Um, the, uh, the, the Boy Scouts are here tonight from Troop 306. Thank you for joining us. Okay, Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. It is moved that if all the business of the meeting as set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Wednesday, May 8th at 8 p.m. Okay, we have a second. Um, all those in favor of, if we don't finish tonight, we, we adjourn to 8 p.m. Wednesday. All those in favor say yes. Yes. All, all those opposed? It is unanimous and a very appropriate volume for a voice vote. We'll now take a test vote. Okay, and the question is, was our first annual town meeting in Arlington, or whatever this land was called at the time, within 30 years of the signing of the Declaration of Independence? Okay, let's close voting. And the correct answer is no. It was, I believe, if I did the math right, 31 years after the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Okay, are there any announcements or resolutions tonight? Oh, yeah, let's scroll through the votes while we take announcements. Uh, yeah, do we have an announcement in the back? Yeah. And is this audio a little muffled on this mic? Okay. Okay. Good evening. Uh, just 60 seconds of your time. Uh, Dave Levy, Precinct 18. I'd like to report from the Conservation Commission's uh, hearing on Thursday night regarding the uh, turf field for the high school. Uh, the results were uh, there did, was a side that won and a side that lost. Uh, if you were a proponent of the high school field as originally constructed, uh, I think it's fair to say you won. The permit was extended and the field will be built as originally voted on by this town and others applauding the debt service. However, um, it's my duty to just raise a concern about what happened on Thursday night and uh, echo that to you now as other elected officials. Um, what I saw on Thursday night was an ask of, of volunteers and staff to start their proceeding, not at seven o'clock, but at 9.45 at night, so taking up considerable amounts of their time, and debate a permit extension, not against existing law, but under law that does not exist and regulations that don't exist today. And once we move from existing law to subjectiveness, it uh, creates a great danger for all of us as elected officials who must enact and make law. So to my fellow members on the select board, town meeting, I urge that you look at this seriously because I was very concerned about what I saw and I think it's only fair to people who volunteer their time in this effort that we apply the law in a transparent fashion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you have any other announcements or resolutions? Uh, seeing none. Oh, uh, can, can we go through the, uh, the vote screens for the test vote? Okay, and while we're waiting for that, are there any reports of committees? Yeah, Mr. Point of order, Mr. Loretti? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. Could I ask that when things are shown on the screen like this, it be done full screen? I've just had my eyes examined twice in the past six months. 
and the, the eye doctor saying I don't need glasses. I can't read these smaller versions of the, uh, if you go back to the, the vote count. Um, Specifically the, the vote screen? Well, and also the changes to the capital planning report until I asked the uh, gentleman over there to, to make it full screen. I couldn't read that either. And I'm sitting halfway back. I can't imagine people in the back of the room can read all of that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Verretti. Uh, do we have a point of order? Well, um, Asha Kepka, Precinct 1. Um, has anybody found a clicker for John Warden? Would you mind looking around and see if there is a loose clicker on the loose? Thank you. Okay. Missing. missing a clicker? Okay. If you, if you see a clicker sitting around, uh, you, could, you could either bring it to the back. Do they just have numbers on them or do they have names as well? They both, okay. Yeah, so we're looking for a clicker with Mr. Borden's name on it. Thank you. Okay, so we have no reports of committees to receive. Um, let's see. And as I mentioned earlier tonight, we take up the town budget and the capital budget. Ms. Deschler. Christine Deschler, Chair of the Arlington Finance Committee. I move that the undisposed articles 29 through 38 inclusive be laid upon the table. Okay, we have a motion to lay all those articles on the table to bring us up to Article 39. All those in favor say yes. yes. All those opposed, it is unanimous. So Article 39 is now before us. Okay, okay Mr. Feeney, did you want to lead us off or, or Ms. Deschler? Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Jim Feeney, Town Manager. Good evening, Town Meeting. I was hoping to take just a moment to introduce the department heads we have in the room. Uh, if I could, if you guys could just wave when I call your names. We have Jose Farias, Assistant Director of Finance for Arlington Public Schools. Ida Cody, our Comptroller. Patricia Shepard, our Chief Information Officer. Kevin Kelly, Fire Chief. Joe Connolly, Director of Recreation. Dana Mann, Director of Assessments. Julie Flaherty, Police Chief, Mike Champa, Director of Inspectional Services, Ashley Marr, Select Board Administrator, Lauren Costa, Budget Coordinator, Alex McGee, Deputy Town Manager for Finance, uh, Julie Clerk, our, Julie Brazil, our Town Clerk, excuse me. <laughs> that works too. Uh, Mike Cunningham, Deputy uh, Town Council now, Jacqueline Munson, Deputy Town Council, uh, Karen Malloy, Director of Human Resources, Anna Litton, Director of Libraries, Colleen Legere, Director of Health and Human Services, Christine Bongiorno, Deputy Town Manager, Operations, Rob Berent, Director of Facilities, Mike Rademacher, Director of Public Works, and uh, Claire Ricker, Director of Planning and Community Development. And then if I could, we have our superintendent of schools, Liz Holman, here to do a brief presentation on the Arlington Public Schools budget. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Holman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and good evening, town meeting members. I would like to begin by thanking all of Arlington's taxpayers and voters for their support of our schools this past fall in the November override vote, and by thanking the Arlington School Committee for their support in the development of the school department budget that I will present on their behalf for your consideration tonight. Next slide. Our vision in the Arlington Public Schools provides a shared direction for the work of all 1,000 employees, 6,000 students, and thousands of Arlington families. We believe that all learners, and that includes all of us, deserve an opportunity to feel belonging in their learning environment, that belonging fosters growth through challenging learning experiences, and that through learning and connecting with one another, we can ensure all students are joyful and empowered in our schools every day. Next slide. Our strategic vision and priorities guide our budget development efforts every year, and this year's priorities are to fund fall override competitive compensation commitments, to plan for increasing electricity supply rates, to adjust elementary staffing levels according to enrollment and maintain existing staffing to support special education and expanding secondary enrollment and to continue implementation of our five-year strategic plan. Next slide. 
One of the many factors we have to consider when developing a budget is student enrollment. Enrollment is a pillar of the long-range plan formula that determines the town's appropriation to the school department. So this slide shows Arlington Public Schools' actual enrollment from FY20, FY18 to 24, and our projected enrollments in the years to come using multiple formulas, which are expected to level out or decrease. The actual enrollment is the blue line. It is worth noting that birth rates are declining in this area, which is resulting in lower elementary enrollment and projections, and classes with significantly higher enrollment are moving into the upper grades, requiring shift in staffing allocations. Next slide. So this graph shows that. It demonstrates the tip we're seeing in elementary versus secondary enrollment, which explains reductions to elementary sections that you'll see in the FY25 budget. You'll notice that secondary enrollments have only been and still are steadily increasing. That's the red line. Meanwhile, elementary enrollments stabilized in 2021 and are now slightly decreasing. This is important because there are licensure requirements and they differ from elementary to secondary levels requiring different staffing models. And we've proactively accounted for that trend using ESSER dollars, we saw it coming, and budget planning in our prior years to make sure we would have the resources to support this even though ESSER funds were going away this year. Next slide. In the strategic planning process, APS identified focal groups of interest whose academic outcomes demonstrate an opportunity for us to improve. The focal groups are listed on this slide and they include students and their families with IEPs who identify as black or African American or Hispanic Latino, who identify as LGBTQIA+, who are multilingual learners or speak a language other than English as the primary language in the home, or who are identified as low income by state agencies. Success of our plan is measured by all students thriving in their engagement, enrichment, and academic opportunities. And we try to set a high standard for the school system to meet the needs of all learners without limiting opportunities for any learners. Making that possible requires a lot of resources. Next slide. I'm pleased to report that we're already doing well towards the demands of this plan, even though it's only in its first year of implementation. On our 2023 accountability rating, before we were officially implementing the plan, APS earned the highest possible designation for a district of meeting or exceeding standards. The state accountability system measures progress towards targets that are designed to reduce opportunity gaps, so this rating is an indicator of progress in the right direction for APS towards meeting the needs of our focal groups and all students. And we're proud of the efforts of our educators, students, and families that made that possible. Next slide. This work also promises to continue to challenge us in the years ahead. Arlington is becoming more diverse with each passing year, and the needs of students and families has only increased following the pandemic. This graph shows how our populations of students who require additional services, including those focal groups I named earlier, have been steadily increasing since 2019. Next slide. The APS budget has also increased year over year to accommodate the needs in the school department. This slide shows that the bulk of APS funding comes from the town's support of our schools through the town allocation, which includes appropriation of Chapter 70 state aid to the community. Funding sources outside of the town's allocation include special revenue, grants, circuit breaker reimbursements for out-of-district special education tuition, and in previous years, COVID-19 grants. Next slide. This chart demonstrates the overall anticipated funding sources, including the town appropriations and other sources of revenue for FY25. Notable on this slide is the total increase to the school allocation of 5.89%, despite decreases in circuit breaker and COVID-19 relief grants. That increase is therefore a significant testament to the dedication of Arlington's taxpayers to our schools and students. Next slide. This chart shows the proposed budget expenses by budget transfer categories within the school department. A couple of things to notice here. One is a contingency line. This represents dollars to be appropriated to salaries at the conclusion of collective bargaining and after position control is finalized with any positions that might be being eliminated next year. Also notable is a 12% increase to special education, which we've purposely targeted for additional investments. Next slide. This is a high-level summary of proposed changes to the FY25 school budget. Notable on this slide is dollars set aside for unit D salary increases. Following the successful override vote, we bargained for additional working hours and historic increases to pay for some of our most critical and lowest paid employees, which we're very proud of, and 1.7 million set aside for collective bargaining with unit A. Also, both efficiencies and additions to the FY25 budget. In accordance with past practice, we have worked to be explicit about what we're eliminating from the budget, as well as what we're adding in order to meet the needs of our students and be responsible with taxpayer dollars. Next slide. It's worth highlighting also that over the past three years, we've used a combination of COVID infusion, grant, and operating funds in order to add positions at Arlington High School, OMS, and Gibbs in anticipation of incoming class sizes that would be bigger, additional learning communities at OMS to prepare for those classes, increases to paraprofessional training and pay at Monotomy Preschool, and balanced elementary class sizes. 
All of these commitments are maintained in the FY25 budget, but they might not be immediately visible because they were built into the base using funds available in previous years. We hope this demonstrates a commitment to forward thinking and purposeful planning, which have made it possible for Arlington to emerge from a challenging budget season and the pandemic with what we believe to be a supportive, reasonable, and responsible budget for FY25 that meets the commitments outlined in the strategic plan and promised to voters in the 2023 override campaign. It is my daily joy to lead our students in learning in the Arlington Public Schools, and I'm grateful to all of you and the full Arlington community for its ongoing support and dedication to providing an excellent education for all APS students, and I am happy to take any members' questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hellman. Okay, so the way the budgets work, which some of you know and some of you might not know, is that uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna run through the budgets. It's vaguely similar to the consent agenda where I'll run through, I'll name the budgets. Uh, I did share um, a doc with the presentation folks just a moment ago, if they check their email, um, so I'll, I'll kind of run through the names of the budgets, and you can also you can see these in Appendix B in detail in the Finance Committee report, and uh, and you can request a hold if uh, if if no one holds a particular budget, like say the education budget as an example, uh, then we will not debate that budget and we'll move on. Uh, so we'll first go through and get the holds so we know what budgets we're gonna have debate on, and then we'll go through those held budgets one by one and have separate debate on each of those. And so we'll have like a speaker queue, unless there's just like one speaker um, uh, for a budget, we might, have, we might open the live speaker queue and, um, and then we'll have normal procedures like terminating debate, but it won't be terminating debate on all matters under the article, it'd be terminating debate on that particular budget, and then we move on to the next budget. Um, Let's see, do we have that document ready? And so there's no speaker queue yet, it's just uh, you just call holds and then we'll get to speaking after we uh, deal with all the holds. Oh good, there it is. Uh, can we uh, zoom into that, increase the size a little bit? Uh, maybe under view, zoom. Yeah, maybe like 200% or more, yeah. Okay, there we go, good. Okay, so yeah, we'll have to scroll live as I run through these. Um, so again, if you wanna have debate or discuss an, uh, uh, a budget, just yell hold when I call that budget. Budget one, finance committee. Two, select board. Three, town manager. Four, human resources. Five, information technology. Six, comptroller. Seven, treasurer collector. Eight, postage. Nine, board of assessors. Uh, can I just say uh, name and precinct? Thank you. Budget 10, legal. 11, town clerk. 12, Board of Registrars. 13, Parking. 14, Planning and Community Development. Uh, name and precinct? You want both? Okay. I'm sorry, he's not speaking into the microphone. Uh, so, yeah, so, so the budget 14 is held by Mr. Loretti from Precinct 7, and 15, uh, budget 15, Redevelopment Board, hold as well? Okay. Budget 15, Redevelopment Board. 16, Zoning Board of Appeals. 17, Public Works. Uh, is that Mr. What's that? Mr. Rademacher, you might want to get the salt numbers ready. <laughs> Number 18, facilities. 19, police services. 20, fire services. 21, inspections. 
22, education. Name? Thank you. And Ms. Friedman from Precinct 15 is holding the education budget. Uh, 23, libraries. 24, health and human services. Is that? Okay. Mr. Wagner from Precinct 15 is holding health and human services. Budget 25, retirement. Okay, Mr. Jameson's holding uh, retirement. Um, Budget 26, insurance. 27, reserve fund. Then fund A, letter A, water and sewer enterprise fund. Fund B, recreation enterprise fund. C, Ed Burns Arena enterprise fund. D, council on aging transportation enterprise fund. And finally, E, Arlington Youth Counseling Center Enterprise Fund. Okay. So we now have six budgets that were held. We will proceed now with, uh, well, let's switch over to the speaker queue. Okay, and let's clear that. And so anyone interested in uh, the uh, discussing the Board of Assessors budget uh, can buzz in to request to speak. And Mr. Revelak, you, you are the one to hold. So let's uh, lead us off, please. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Steve Revelak, Precinct 1. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I have a few questions that will probably, well, to direct towards the uh, Director of Assessments or to the Board of Assessors. So the assessor's office plays a very important role in town in that they are responsible for recording new growth. You know, as a background, Massachusetts has a law called Proposition 2.5, which limits the net tax levy increase to 2.5% per year. So new growth generally comes from construction, for example, when someone replaces a building with a more valuable one, and the new, more, more valuable one generates more tax revenue. New growth is not subject to the limits of Proposition 2.5. I mean, this is important for a community like Arlington because our expenses often grow at more than 2.5% each year, and having enough new growth means that we can close the gap between 2.5% and the actual increase in costs, as opposed to having to do periodic overrides. So according to MassDOR's Division of Local Services, Arlington's new growth rate was 0.95% for FY 2024. Mr. Moderator, I'm wondering if that's typical for Arlington. Uh, Director Mann, uh, Director of Assessments, do you have an answer to Mr. Revelock's question? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Dana Mann, Director of Assessments. I'm sorry, you might need to pull the, the microphone up. It's, uh, yeah, sorry, thank you. Is that better? Yes, thank you. And the question was, um, our last year's growth rate, is that typical for... Yeah. For Arlington. For Arlington, yeah. I would say yes, it is. Mm -hmm. It's uh, projecting, uh, trending upward, but it would be typical for a town this size mm -hmm. with this um, uh, particular um, commercial size. Okay, yeah, it's, it, we were 270th out of 371, but I, it seemed typical to be, and I thank you for, thank you for sharing that you agree. Um, now, in terms of the breakdown of new growth, uh, about 86% of that came from, uh, was classified as residential, and I was wondering if you can talk about how, um, what kind of properties this comes from, and how you go about uh, capturing that new growth so that, you know, it's recorded fairly in the tax rolls. I'm sorry, would you would you repeat the last part? Uh, how, what's your process for you know, sort, sort of reassessing pros, properties and capturing the new growth? Sure, so we have several methods of capturing growth. Uh, initially, we receive all of the permits that are pulled in the um, Inspectional Services Department. Um, so anyone who would take out a permit to say, uh, put a deck on a, on a piece of property um, that would be recorded. We would measure the deck, we'd assess the, the deck and the difference between their last year's assessment and the new assessment, essentially the deck, would be growth. Okay. 
Thank you. <clears throat> now, the next biggest contributor to new growth was personal property. This, um, this was about 12, 13-ish percent. So what, what exactly is personal property? <laughs> Personal property is anything that is um, not real estate, um, not attached to a particular pro uh, property. Um, and it, it, the definition varies by um, the type of uh, entity who's claiming this property uh, and their tax status. So there would be several different answers to that question. Okay. Okay, and um, our last contributor was uh, commercial growth, which was about 1.2%. Anything remarkable there from your perspective? No, I think those numbers line up precisely with uh, the mix of commercial and residential uh, property that we have in town. So a uh, final question, um, and this is where we get into budgets. Um, because you, your department has to go around and visit all of these properties and, you know, periodically look at the, uh, the you know, the physical plant and, and the, the stuff that you're using. Uh, do you feel that your office has enough staffing and support to do the work that it needs to do? I do. Uh, we, we, we do have certain requirements in, in terms of inspections. Uh, based on some of the DOR's uh, regulations. Uh, and we do uh, hire uh, companies um, to do some of that work for us. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Seeing no one else interested in discussing uh, the Board of Assessors budget, we will now move on to the uh, planning and community development budget. So let's clear the speaker queue and uh, bring up Mr. Loretti, who held it. And then we'll take up Mr. Knoll afterwards. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, uh, Precinct 7. I have a question um, about the planning department and in particular responsibilities relating to the determination of when a special permit is needed, which body grants that special permit, in particular the Redevelopment Board and or the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, and also uh, who's responsible for the content of legal notices for hearings that the ARB holds. And I'm curious about this because over the past year, there was one case where a um, special permit was referred to the Redevelopment Board when it really should have been referred to the Zoning Board of Appeals. There was another when it was referred to the Zoning, uh, to the Redevelopment Board and no special permit was needed. And then there was the MBTA Communities Act where the Attorney General has deemed the legal notice for our last, uh, for the uh, special permit hearing as defective. And if you look at the, the budget for the Planning departments, it's increased over the past five years. The level of staffing's increased, and, and the, certainly the budget itself has increased. And I'm trying to figure out just who's responsible for, within the planning department, what position is responsible for these determinations as to where, what happens when a, when a um, permit application comes in, and also the, the um, content and distribution of the legal notices for hearings, both special permit hearings and, z and the zoning bylaw change hearings that the redevelopment board's required to hold. That was quite a run-on sentence, but uh, Director Richter, uh, would you like to answer that? Thank you very much. Claire Ricker, uh, your Director of Planning and Community Development. Uh, Mr. Loretti, that responsibility ultimately lies with me. Okay. Sorry, excuse me, I'll start over again. My name is Claire Ricker. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development. And to answer your question, Mr. Loretti, ultimately that responsibility lies with me. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Moder. Um, you know, I appreciate the Director's comment. I'm, I'm not convinced that in particular for the determination of what's supposed to happen to special permit applications that it's not the building inspector's responsibility because he is the zoning enforcement officer. And, and I really think the town needs to come to some clarity on this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay, seeing no other speakers for planning and community development budget, we'll move on to public works. Um, so, Mr. Jameson. 
Do you want to lead us off? And um, we'll take Mr. Kepline after that if you have a question about public works budget. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Oh, here. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12. Um, I might ask the Director of uh, Public Works if he could report on uh, the state of our decreasing uh, the trash that we incinerate and the budget related thereto. Uh, Director Rademacher. And the, and the future uh, projections on that. Uh, Michael Rademacher, Director of Public Works. I, I'm, I apologize, I didn't hear the uh, question. I, my question was, could you comment on the uh, costs of our trash disposal and incineration and our efforts to further reduce the amount of tonnage um, that we incinerate um, and, and the future projections on the costs there as, as contracts turn over? I guess I'm still not clear. You'd like me to comment on my thoughts on future costs? Well, are, are we making progress in further reducing our trash that we, that we um, burn? Well, yes, our last year's uh, numbers were down um, and it was quite a kind of an anomaly. You know, it could have been economic, um, it could have been based on the economy, uh, cost of goods increasing, so people purchased a little less and th threw away less. Um, that was kind of a blip. For the, for the most part, our trends have been uh, fairly consistent on the amount of solid waste. And do you see um, large increases? I know we had a contract turnover recently, large increases in, as contracts renew in the future. Increases in the budget haul, for the for the, the, the hauling budget, the hauling and incineration budget. We have a, we're going to be putting out a contract in the very near future for a hauling contract to be re renewed next fiscal year, and it's yet to be seen what those numbers will be, but they will be higher than what we're currently paying. Okay, you can comment on salt if you wish, but you don't have to. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Rademacher. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kepline, and then we'll take Mr. Wagner after that. Just a reminder, we, we do have these seats reserved up front uh, for the uh, on-deck speakers. Mr. Kepline. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mark Kepline, Precinct 9. So uh, last time after Wednesday, Wednesday's session, um, I was leaving and crossing the street, and uh, I was assisted by a police officer. Um, and there was a car that did not slow or stop or show any signs of recognizing the crosswalk. Um, fortunately, the police woman stopped me, and then a police car later, I guess, had a word with that driver. But uh, many of my constituents are concerned about pedestrian safety, and I'm hoping that we could somehow get the crosswalks repainted more often. Um, with thermoplastic, retroreflective, white markings, or, uh, or even conventional paint, um, especially on the heavier traveled uh, ways where cross marks are virtually invisible, especially by St. John's Church or anywhere on Pleasant Street or Mystic or Mass Ave. Um, after all, roads, water and sewer are the primary services of the town that nearly every resident uses on a daily basis. And uh, I, I think we should give more attention to that. Can, can you answer about uh, how much the budget is for repainting crosswalks and street sure. paint? Uh, Director Rademacher, do you have an answer to that? How much it costs to paint the crosswalks? Uh, Michael Rademacher, Director of Public Works. We, we don't have a separate line item for the painting of crosswalks. The uh, crosswalks are painted internally by staff uh, mm -hmm. on, except on occasions where a road is newly paved and we can put down thermoplastic, which you mentioned on older roads where there are already layers of existing paint. Um, we, we can't apply that type of material. So we do look to in, improve the paint condition when we pave a road and then we look to maintain it on our older roads with our own staff, but I appreciate your uh, comments and concerns, and I, I know we are looking at ways to make improvements to crosswalks, especially on our busier roadways, and um, finding ways to uh, improve the visibility of the crosswalk is something we are looking to do. All right. Well, elsewhere, it's possible to grind down old paint in order to apply something new. 
It, it, it is. It obviously adds significantly to the cost, and, and it's not something that that's something something we do have in our budget currently. Okay, and it's usually thermoplastic is applied by an outside contractor, right? Correct. That's not something our staff. Yeah, it's a specialty does. operation. Okay. Correct. Um, I did have another question. It's, I don't know if it's your bailiwick or not, but uh, blue bikes. Um, so revenue from Uber and Lyft uh, trips um, is being directed to blue bikes. Is that right? That is uh, not. You are correct. That is not public works. <laughs> okay. Maybe planning. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Mr. Wagner, and then we'll take Mr. Tremblay. Thank you, Mr. Moderator Carl Wagner, Precinct 15. I had originally risen and included a question about SALT. I will not ask it now. Um, I did want to ask uh, a question and also provide a compliment to the Department of Public Works. Uh, for some years, I have been asking for Mill Street to receive a yellow stripe. Mill Street is much busier now with the um, process of the high school project getting closer to completion. And the stripe that the Department of Public Works has put down has dramatically, I think, decreased the chance of, of accidents there. I would also ask the Department of Works, please, to look at their own territory, Grove Street, uh, which probably, and many others, but particularly Grove Street. Also, a question that's a little bit of a criticism. Uh, does the Department of Public Works have enough money in its budget for uh, Pleasant Street and Jason Street and other heavily potholed roads? And could they please uh, work on that? It's been very bad this year. I, I lost a tire, but it wasn't in Arlington, but it's, uh, I've noticed it in Arlington. So I, I wonder if the budget is adequate for uh, pothole removal. Uh, Director Rademacher. Michael Rademacher, Director of Public Works. We, we do have a, a sufficient budget to repair potholes. The roads that you um, commented on are almost uh, beyond repairing with potholes. Uh, and just repairing potholes, the, the condition is such that they need um, further work. We have work planned still yet on Pleasant Street. We're looking to do some water main replacement, so we, we don't want to, excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we, we don't want to um, expend a lot of funds on Pleasant Street uh, before we do that work, and, but we do plan on paving it in full when that project is done. And um, Jason Street, the gas company, recently did some work there, and we'll be holding them to the standards of having to um, repair those trenches this spring and summer. Thank you. Uh, the adequate maintenance of our sidewalks and roadways is incredibly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll take uh, Mr. Tremblay next, and then Ms. Kepka. Ed Tremblay, Precinct 19. Mr. Moderator, I have a question for the uh, DPW director. <laughs> and I want to thank, uh, thank Mr. Wagner for introducing the pothole questions, because I'm going to ask about that after the SALT question. What's your question, Mr. Tremblay? The, uh, after the SALT question. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Rademacher, we have a SALT question. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Michael Rademacher, Director of Public Works. This year, we used approximately 3,800 ton. Well, I guess that's uh, not much, considering that we, of course, we didn't much have much. Of, well, but we did have some icy storms, so... Um, okay, now the real thing I want to talk about. Um, I've been bothered for some time watching Feeney Brothers dig up fairly nice streets. You know, the town does a pretty decent job going through and repaving the streets, and uh, then Feeney Brothers comes and digs them up because we do need to replace the gas lines. I'm not, not quibbling about that. And I've watched them, and they dig them up, and then they throw most of the dirt back into the hole, and they run in up and down with a plate compactor, and then they throw the rest of it in, compact it again, pave it and go home. And then for a year, we have to drive over roads like the one, like the stretch of Mass Ave going from Grove Street up to Brattle Street. It's bumpy and humpy, and sometimes they have to come in and fill it in because it's rough. Can we make Feeney Brothers actually compact the dirt they're putting back in properly so that 
so that it, it doesn't settle so much and unevenly? So I think um, we, can, we can look at that, right? We don't have the staff to monitor every um, project they're working on on a hour by hour basis. We do require that they uh, backfill their trench appropriately and that they are patched and we expect there's going to be settlement and that's why we require them to do a temporary patch and come back a year later and mill that patch out and and create a, a, a permanent patch that is wider than the trench that they created in order to make a, a, a more navigable and smooth surface. So it's inevitable you're going to get some settlement. We can have discussions with them to see if there's a way to get a better temporary product. Well, they just have to backfill it properly, which is like every six inches and compact it, another six inches compact it, instead of putting in two or three feet of dirt running over that and then another foot and be done. So they, I've, they do, I don't think it's exactly as you're suggesting, but they probably them. can do a better job. They, they have plenty of projects in town. I've watched them. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I, I, I've watched them as well. So we were watching two different projects. <laughs> um, so, the, so the repaving, that's another problem because they only do half the street, but they're replacing gas lines that go to both sides of the street. So that means the other half of the street has a bunch of trenches that we have to go across. And even after they're done repaving, it's, e it's never flat, it's never smooth. It's either a dip or a pump. And it's perpendicular to the street, so it's like running over speed bumps, little speed bumps. They're not, they're not huge, but still, can we make them repave the whole street? And, and so the whole street comes out smooth the way it was before they started? We have, on occasion, when, the, when they disturb so much of the road that it makes more sense to pave the entire road, we have uh, worked with them to do such. I don't believe that we can have them pave entire roads all the time. Because that, that trench that they leave on the half that they don't pave eventually turns into a pothole because it, it's a crack. Uh, ultimately, the water gets into it. Ultimately, their, their entire work site is paved, the trench and the, and the gas connections. I, I appreciate the fact that it does create a, a temporary washboard effect and that even when it's final, it's never the same as original. We hold a higher standard when we have a, a newly paved road or a road that's been paved within five years. We hold them to a higher standard, but realistically, we can't ask for perfection on roads that aren't perfection to begin with. Well, yeah, I understand that. And some of the roads we're digging up are, are not, you know, I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about primarily the roads that, do it, that we have that were in pretty good shape. And they're never the same after Fe Feeney Brothers gets done with them. They're not, you know, it's, you know, may maybe it's because I drive old pickup trucks that, that ride hard, but, and I'm getting, maybe it's because I'm getting old, but I feel these bumps. Uh, and, it, and it reminds me every time I drive down them. So, um, okay, another topic. Um, intersections. Yeah, the, the, yeah. Go, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I am running out of time. The, uh, for years, the town has been uh, reconfiguring intersections and tightening them up and um, making them squarer and, and removing uh, wedges and curves and, and things that actually make it possible to drive a truck in town without running the curbs over. Do you, do you have a CDL? I do not. Okay. Um, because the way the town has been reconfiguring uh, configuring cur intersections lately, you know, I, I, I have to drive, I drive a uh, um, Mel's uh, Landau and I either have to drive over the curbs, which I really don't want to do because the tires cost a lot, or I have to drive on the wrong side of the road to get through these intersections now. And it can be kind of dangerous because uh, people aren't expecting me to do that. And either I have to wait and wait and wait, or uh, in the case of uh, coming out of Heard Road and Forest, or onto Forest Street, for instance, people aren't necessarily looking up Forest Street all that much when they come out of Park Ave Extension. So they pull up to the intersection quick, look down Forest Street, start up, and there I am on the wrong side of the street, trying to get out without running the curbs over. Sure, I, I appreciate this, and we've had this discussion, and, and, uh, and I can assure you that the designs that we put forth 
are intended for um, pedestrian safety and the safety of the majority of the users. Uh, we do not violate any design criteria well, I know that. in doing this work. Um, but I think and the so I think the, the benefit uh, outweighs um, the sometimes the inconvenience. And we're, we're out of time. All right, thank uh, you very much. Okay. I just want to remind folks, you don't have to use all seven minutes. And if you enjoyed that, I believe Mr. Tremblay and Mr. Rademacher, uh, you can watch their performance at Dona Villa every Thursday night. We'll take uh, Ms. Kepka next, and then Ms. Malofchek. Hello, Asha Katka, Precinct 1. Um, I have a question about trees in Arlington, and I believe this is under Public um, Works Department. About streets? Uh, trees, oh, public, tree. public trees. Trees. Okay. Um, I'm very concerned about the, the number of trees we are losing and their health. We um, constantly are hearing about um, sick trees being removed, um, and I know that um, the town has a budget for a tree warden, um, for tree removal, you know, trimming, and um, does not address um, sort of taking care of the trees, uh, addressing the sickness of the trees. Um, and I wonder if this is a budgetary uh, policy. Are you asking like, like how much money is spent on tree removal or? Um, no, no, I, I mean, sort of, uh, for the care of the trees, you know, maybe addressing the diseases, uh, prophylactic uh, measurements. Uh, Director Rademacher, do you have a question about, uh, uh, any answers about um, the maintenance or care or removal of trees? It's like going to a dentist, you know, if your dentist was just pulling your teeth out instead of addressing the sick teeth before they get too sick. We have been losing so many trees, and I don't think we've been planting enough trees to replace the lost trees, yes? Uh, so, uh, Michael Rademacher, Director of Public Works. S to answer your question, uh, we plant um, over 300 trees a year. Uh, a few years ago, we performed a tree survey in town to get a baseline of the number, uh, health, and uh, variety of species in town. Do you town. know how many trees? Because I think that the, um, the number on the uh, town uh, website was significantly higher than in the actual um, inventory. I, I don't recall the number off the top of my head. I, I just know at the time of that survey, we worked with the tree committee to do an evaluation of where we are today and where we were at the height of our treed canopy, that street was 2018, trees. 2018, yes? Uh, yes, and mm -hmm. um, it was determined at that time based on the amount of trees that we lose over the course of a, a year for health reasons About or- 500? Or, or, uh, no, so or storm damage, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, about 150 trees. Okay. The planting of 300 in, in, uh, in about 20 years or so would get us to that previous canopy. So that is the goal of our current planting program. There is, it is taken into account the trees we lose to health, storm, or, or other reasons. Um, and it, is, it strives to get a net increase of trees. But there's a lot of pests. I noticed that uh, some areas, I live in East Arlington, um, there's a lot of pests um, attacking the trees and those trees are just dying. Sure, so the, the, that survey we did take, took that into account, but even in, in addition to that, um, there is a significant threat to our um, ash trees, uh, and we are treating for the emerald ash borer in oh, order so you, to protect those trees. So you are treating, okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, Ms. Deschler. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. I would just like to point out that this FY25 budget has considerable uh, money in the budget for um, uh, tree care. Uh, we have a um, maintenance contract. We have uh, $65,000 for tree planning, $30,000 uh, for tree pest management. Um, so there is a considerable amount of money um, appropriate, uh, appropriated for tree care in this year's budget. Great, thank you. Um, Ms. Malopchuk next, and then Mr. Slickman. Oh, oh um, and before Ms. Malopchuk starts, uh, is, Mr. Warden, did you ever locate your clicker? No. 
we're still missing Mr. Borden's clicker. Um, so everyone keep an eye out for that. Check your things. Uh, Ms. Lop Malofchek, go ahead. Uh, Beth Malofchek, precinct. Beth Malofchek, precinct nine. Um, I have a simple question. I noticed last year, Mr. Rodemacher, that the tree pits in front of Town Hall Garden were bricked over. I think I counted nine or ten of them. I'd like to know why and can we get them back, please, and have trees put in them along Mass Ave, um, Mr. Moderator? Mr. Rademacher? Michael Rademacher, Director of Public Works. I know at one time we did fill some of them in for safety reasons, they were tripping hazards, but as we do uh, continue with our street tree planting and look for areas to plant trees, we can revisit those locations. Is this dependent on fixing gas leaks? I mean, that was the only thing that occurred to me, why you, you would brick them yeah. over rather than planting a tree there. Uh, it, there is likely some of those locations where we would uh, wait to verify that there are no gas leaks. I'm sure we did lose some because of gas and the tree warden looks into that as we find planting spots. So. How would I, or how would the date be determined for when trees would be planted along that stretch of Mass Ave? I, I can confer with the tree warden and ask if he's comfortable with the condition of the soil. I, I don't have a date for you right now. Okay, so if it's because the gas leak is so bad, then I'd really want us to be pestering the gas company to fix the leak there. I, I'm, I'm not suggesting there is still a gas leak. There may have been one when we originally paved it over. We'd have to look. I yeah, know there was work there's, done there's on that. There's gas at Uncle Sam Plaza. I walk by it every day. Um, so there's also a tree that fell over behind the Uncle Sam monument that's behind John Leone's building where his office is. So I'd just like to request an oak tree to replace it there. And we lost a tree pit on Russell Street when the curb was done. So I'd like that to come back. So we have an online request for tree requests, and you're more than welcome. For the tree For trees. Pit, a for tree, tree pit. Yes, correct. Tree pit request. Yes. So they concreted it over, so we'd like it back, Russell Street. Yep. And then, okay, I'll put the tree request in for <laughs> Uncle Sam. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Four and minutes left. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Before Mr. Slickman comes up, because there's a non-zero chance that he'll terminate debate, uh, why don't we take Mr. Warden, because I did see Mr. Warden's hand up, and I didn't take into account that he doesn't have a clicker to request to speak. So let's take Mr. Warden first, and then Mr. Slickman can move to terminate, I mean, can speak. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm, I'm embarrassed that my clicker seems to have disappeared, but uh, never happened before. Um, <clears throat> I wanted, uh, John Worden, Precinct 8. Um, I, I wanted to, um, for one thing, uh, I'm speaking of uh, my street, Jason Street, the part between the, the avenue and uh, Irving Street, um, where I walk my dog every night, so I'm very familiar with that sidewalk. And there were 10 trip hazards along there, and I'm pleased that the, uh, the public works have uh, eliminated four of them by uh, taking out the bumps and paving them with fresh black top. And there are two of them that uh, occurred when town trees were taken out, uh, street trees were taken out, and the, there's, the street trees had entered, uh, taken up part of the sidewalks, so there's just a hole there now. Um, but <clears throat> the, other, the other thing I, I, that we c occurred in our street is the gas company uh, this uh, uh, last fall and going into December finally put in a new line and got rid of the gas leaks that we've been putting up with for decades. And uh, that, that was a, a great benefit. Um, but the, the ga then they often had to tear up people's sidewalks and sometimes people's front yards. And then they slop some blacktop on them. They don't do a good job like, like our, our uh, men do when they put down some blacktop. They just slop it in any old way and it's, they don't uh, compound it properly. Uh, you know, compact it properly so it's full of uh, you know, irregularities, you might say. In one case, they, a brick sidewalk, uh, they, they took out the bricks and piled them at the side of the, the pe uh, pe uh, sidewalk and slopped on some uh, blacktop. And this is months later, the, the bricks are still on, on the 
on a little wall beside the sidewalk, and the, uh, the blacktop is gradually sinking into the ground. Uh, so I, I wondered, uh, Mr. Rademacher, if, if, the, uh, if you, the public works or somebody could get after the gas, gas company and get them to hire someone uh, to do the, do the paving work properly so that the sidewalks don't have this, these um, further difficulties in, for people walking. Uh, Mr. Rademacher? Uh, Michael Rademacher, Director of Public Works. Uh, thank you for that question. It is something that we are um, intend to work harder with the gas company to have these repairs made. It, it, the, the, the gas company is rightfully so doing a lot of work to repair um, numerous gas leaks and the unfortunate consequences are trenching and these types of activities, but it is our um, intent to hold them to it and make sure they come and make these repairs adequately and we are making strides in a better accounting system in order to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, Mr. Slickman. Paul Schleckman, Precinct 9, motion to terminate debate under this budget item. Second. Okay, we have motion to terminate, de terminate debate. Remember our exercise at the beginning. Let's try that. Uh, all those in favor of terminating debate on the public works budget, say yes. Yes. All those opposed? It is terminated. That was very nice. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Warden's clicker number is 96. Does that help us? So if you see a number 96 or the name Warden on a clicker, please return it. Okay, that takes us to the education bus budget. Um, and Ms. Friedman, you're up. And so let's clear the speaker queue to get a fresh queue. And Ms. Friedman, come on up. Speaker queue is cleared. And then we'll take Mr. Loretti. Um. Beth Ann Friedman, Precinct 15. Um, on page 30 of the um, report. Um, Microphone. Uh, okay. On page 30 of the, the um, school report, um, it says that 28 point in 2024, 28. What? Hold on. We have a point of order. Ms. Ms. Friedman, do you want to try the center mic, see if that's any better? I've paused your timer, so go ahead, go ahead try that. No, that's okay. Um, so 28.9% of the Arlington Public School students are identified as high needs. Can you break that down? Um, because is it special needs or what, what can... Dr. Homan? is that population. Certainly, so that population, that measure is an aggregate measure. It takes into account multilingual learners, um, students with IEPs, students from low-income households. It's an aggregate. Sometimes we use that measure because it's useful because in some places, those other measures don't have enough students to give us a measure of how many there are, and so this one can be a useful. That just seemed awfully high quantification. for a percentage. We have a lot of students who need a lot of resources. Okay, and then I have another question about one of your budgets for um, Stratton School. Um, that budget increased from uh, 3.99 million to 5.23 million, mm -hmm. um, and it's the largest increase of any of the schools. Uh, can you explain what that increase entails? I certainly can, and sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. Liz Homan, superintendent. Um, Stratton School, in one of, there are a couple different things happening there. One is that we are trying to move as many resources to school-based allocations as we can, and that includes special education staff. Stratton houses our biggest um, specialized learning community in the district, and that's a special education program. Specifically at Stratton, they house the program that is for students who have autism. And that program has expanded significantly over the past few years, and we've allocated more resources to that okay. school and that program. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Mr. Loretta, I think I called next. And then uh, let's uh, take Mr. Gersh. I don't think we've heard him. Yet. 
Thanks, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, um, Precinct 7. And I, I preface my um, questions and comments by noting that the um, school department budget report indicates a 30% increase in spending over the past four years. And the um, Finance Committee report, if you read beyond the letter at the beginning from the chair, which talks about a 3.5% uh, increase in the operating budget, the actual increase this year is 8.5%. And I'm wondering if anyone um, can tell me, is that sort of spending growth, 8.5% a year, sustainable? Uh, Dr. Holman? Or Mr. Slipman? Paul Slipman, I'm chair of the school committee. 8.5% uh, growth is unusual but we just passed an operating override with some very specific spending targets that we were looking at improving. One of the things that we looked at in terms of the town manager 12 comparative districts is that our teacher salaries are below the town manager 12 average and we're having challenges in terms of hiring and retaining staff. So there is uh, an increase that is certainly above the normal 3%, 4% growth rate for a school budget uh, in order to compensate for adjusting uh, salaries. And as salaries are about 85% of our budget, uh, th this is going to be a, a big uh, increase here. And we did make the case for this within the context of the uh, override that was passed by a two to one margin last November. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would note that uh, as of now, um, Arlington is spending more per student than both uh, Winchester and Belmont, um, slightly more. And then if you look at the um, in-district spending, it, there's even a greater divergence with Arlington spending more per, per student for in-district in, um, services. Um, I guess the next question, though, is we're talking about 8.5% this year. Does anyone know what the percentages are going to be in the next few years? Uh, we, uh, we've worked with the uh, Finance Committee, and you can take a look in their book. There is a five-year fiscal, uh, three-year fiscal plan at this point, uh, which has targeted numbers for town appropriations for the schools. Okay, well, I'll take a look there. Um, I would note that the, in, the enrollment projections pretty much now are flat, and then in future years will be going down. Uh, the final question I have is, um, some of you here are old enough to remember um, former selectman Charlie Lyons. And he was around, if not at the beginning of the time that Arlington started doing property tax overrides, certainly um, at the time of some of the early ones. And I recall the commitment he made when he was chairing the, the Board of Selectmen that when they had an override, the total spending on the town side and the school side would be capped to particular amounts outside of um, growth in the health insurance budget. And I'm wondering, has that continued is there any cap in overall spending in those two budgets, town side and school side? And how does the current school, if there is, how the current school spending compares with those caps? Uh, yes, the caps are part of the uh, fiscal stability plan every time we go out for an override. But there are exceptions within the plan that were built into it. So we take a, you, you need to take a look at our strategic plan that we brought to the Finance Committee, we brought to the town, we brought to the voters of the town, and said, we're going to go and make this uh, consistent increase under the, uh, the stability plan, but we do need additional resources to do things like uh, improve our teacher salary rate uh, and improve our services for high need students. Do you know what the cap was for the Education Department for the, during this latest override? Uh, I'll let... Um, the chair of the budget committee answer that. Dr. Allison Ampey. Kirsten Allison Ampey, precinct 13 and school committee member uh, and budget chair. So the caps are found in the long range plan as Mr. Schlickman was saying. Um, they are three and a half percent on the growth on the growth of the general education portion of the budget. 7% on the growth of the seven of the special education portion of the budget and then a growth factor which either adds to or takes away from our budget depending on whether we have added students over the past year or decreased the students. We have, as you say, we have been 
in before this, we were in a growth period where we were adding hundreds of students over the years. Uh, at this point, we're at a plateau. We have done one decrease. This year was an increase. Um, we'll see where it goes. Okay. Well, thank you. So it sounds like, um, given the large increases, your subsequent increases should be much smaller to get back to that average. If it's 3.5%, did you say, outside of special education? It's 3.5% for general education, 7% for special education, and then a half per additional student. Right, but, okay, upper. but there are additional students, and if the overall budget's increasing at 8.5%, then it has to be lower. Thank it's you. Not, that doesn't, those are not, the 8.5% was because we had an override. I'm asking about overall, inc overall increase in spending growth. I don't care where the money comes from. This year, there was a increase of the total budget of an additional $3.1 million as part of the override plan that was in addition to the 3.5% on general ed, 7% okay. on special ed. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. Okay. So that 3.5% that isn't really a real cap, is what she's saying. But thank you. I, I appreciate the thank answers. You. Uh, so let's get some speakers that we haven't heard from. Uh, at least not in a while, so I'll pull from the bottom of the deck and we'll start with uh, Ms. Benedict and then we'll move up to Pi Fisher from the balcony. Apologies for not giving you advance notice. Does the balcony have a microphone up there? Great, thank you. Ms. Benedict, go ahead. Beth Benedict, Precinct 21. I had a question about the 504 budget, uh, item 3302. And I wonder who could answer that question for me? The question would be, why is it doubled? So I see that it doubled. I didn't see the special education budget doubled. And I'm just curious to know what the money is being spent on. And it decreases in 2025, but it goes up almost double from 23 24. Is that an increase in students? Just wondering. Dr. Homan? Liz Homan, superintendent. By any chance, can you tell me what page you're on? I am on page 125. Thank you. Give me the line number you were on again. 3302. 3302. Oh, people services. People services. Do you know? So that was increased in FY24, so we would need to go back and look at why. Um, that is a question that we are happy to answer, but we can't answer on the spot right now. Chances are there was a reallocation. Um, we have also recoded recently because we have a new chart of accounts, and that shuffled expenses um, to new codes, and so that could be part of the reason as well. We would have to look into it. There is not a significant increase in students on 504 plans between FY23 and FY24. So even though it says 5,000 in 2023, and then it goes up to 16,000 in 2024? So Am I reading that wrong? And that was, a, that was from last budget year to this budget year. Mm -hmm. So we would need to go back at last budget year's build to understand where that came from. Didn't come from this budget year's build. And then it goes down again in 2025. So um, Slightly, yes. I'm not sure. Okay. So we don't know. Okay, I, thank you. I'm happy to find out for you. Thank you. You're welcome. Great, right, thank you. And we'll take uh, Pi Fisher next from the balcony and then uh, Ms. Babiars. Six, Pi Fisher, Precinct Six, motion to terminate debate. Uh, we have motion to terminate debate. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor of terminating debate, say yes. Yes. All those opposed, say uh, for for the education budget. Clearly, um, all those opposed, say no. No. The debate is terminated. That brings us to the. I'm just looking to see. We do not have five uh, uh, 
contested people standing. Um, uh, it brings us to the Health and Human Services budget. Um, and that was held by Mr. Wagner. Let's clear the speaker queue, please. Mr. Wagner? Okay, speaker queue is cleared. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Carl Wagner, Precinct 15. Um, I would like to ask on, on this budget for uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, it looks like it's about a quarter of a million dollars. Could I ask how many staff are now in that uh, area? Uh, is Director Ledger with us? Am I pronouncing that correctly? Hi, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm Colleen Legere, Director of Health and Human Services. We have three staff, three full-time staff. Thank you. It's my understanding that our DEI efforts started particularly after the death of, of, of uh, in 2020 of George Floyd. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering why we have to have three DEI people as our budgets are beginning to look crazy after 2027 and we have a chance now to perhaps go back to one person and make it, it impact that way? So they hold different responsibilities. We have the DEI director, um, we have the ADA coordinator who manages the ADA um, American Disabilities Act, um, and then we have the community engagement coordinator who works with various departments, works on language access, um, looks at equity from a range of issues with the town, and then they coordinate three of the commissions, um, Human Rights Commission, Rainbow Commission, <clears throat> and the Disabilities Commission, and the engagement coordinator will be um, the liaison to the Police Advisory Commission. Thank you. My understanding of our DEI efforts is that you could work with other parts of town government and other areas in town to make improvements uh, for all minority and age minority groups. Um, I'm concerned that I'm hearing that there are ADA violations in quite a lot of developments, and I'm also concerned about an innocent black bystander who was taken by the police when they were looking for a white criminal. Thank you. Ms. Malofchik? Beth Malofchek, Precinct 9. Um, Mr. Moderator, I'm just curious about the amount uh, that the town received in the Sackler settlement, I don't know what else to call it, and um, how those funds have been applied. Uh, Director Legier, uh, do you have an answer to that question? Hi, yes, we've, uh, Colleen Legier, Director of Health and Human Services, um, it's been distributed over the past several months. Um, I think it's over 270,000. And so far we've um, about 40 to 50,000. We have a pair recovery coach. We've been work our prevention services manager has been working with pair recovery coach and the clinicians from the police department um, to respond to overdoser overdoses and people who have experienced or are experiencing um, um, substance use issues, helping them through recovery, um, helping to pay for um, sober living facilities and other ways to support people who are trying to work through recovery. Also working um, with other police departments in the community to dis distribute Narcan and other life-saving mechanisms. Where um, is Narcan available in town? Yes. Where? So we have avail folks that are able to come into the Health and Human Services Department to access it. Um, it's been distributed to, um, I think other, some of the other departments have it available. And then we're also installing Nalox boxes in several town sites, one being Department of Public Works, one will be here in Town Hall, um, Health and Human Services. I, I'm asking these questions because I actually filled out one of your questionnaires about ideas for um, how to spend the money or what to do. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just concerned that the Narcan be um, readily available and that um, your department think outside the box mm -hmm. in terms of where it might be available in case it's um, teens. Um, 
who would be inhibited from, you know, going to the office, <laughs> going to your office. Sure. sure. So, um, so I just would encourage you to to continue doing that. I mean, obviously you're um, conferring with other towns and what's working, what protocols are working, but. Um, uh, a friend did lose a child, and so I just think it's so very important for us to think outside the box and provide the Narcan in um, you know innovative ways. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Seeing no more speakers for Health and Human Services budget, we'll move on to the last budget that was held, which is the retirement budget which was held by Mr. Jameson. So let's clear the speaker queue and uh, Mr. Jameson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12. Um, the retirement budget is seven and a half percent of our expenditures. Um, we rarely hear from the retirement uh, board uh, report. Um, I, and I, uh, am, I hope that the town manager, the deputy town manager of finance and Ms. Cody, who uh, uh, sits on the board, will endeavor to have the board provide us annually a report on this budget. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Just so I'm clear, Mr. Jameson, are you asking for someone to speak to? I'm asking the town moderator, Deputy Town Manager of Finance, and the comptroller in future years to ensure mm -hmm. that the, the uh, retirement board presents a, re a report to the, to the, to the body in that they spend $16.5 million, 7.5% of our budget. Thank you very much. Understood. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other speakers, and we've exhausted all the budgets, uh, we will now take up a vote. And this is, uh, is there a point of order? Yeah, Mr. Wagner? Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Carl Wagner, Precinct 15. Uh, has the town meeting member who did not have a clicker uh, found it? And if not, is there a provision for a town meeting member in this situation to handle votes, please? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, did we find the clicker over here? Is this Mr. We seem to have, I don't know if it's Mr. Morton's clicker or is it a replacement clicker? Got it, thank you. So if we took a vote with that clicker now, it would not be recorded, is that correct? Okay, so it's almost 9.30. Um, why don't we take a break right now so we can get that clicker resolved and uh, we'll come back in 10 minutes to vote on the budgets. Don't miss it. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. Okay, I think we're just finishing up, hopefully getting a clicker working. Okay, and we'll go through all the screens. It, it appears we didn't go through all the screens last time, so we'll just make the town budgets vote our official test vote. Okay. And do we have the all clear on the electronic voting? And great. Okay, so let's bring up a vote on the main motion of Article 39, which is an appropriation for the town budgets. Voting's not open until the green light is on, remember, but this will be an appropriation for 178,735,969 dollars for the town budgets. Okay, voting is now open. If you are in favor of that total appropriation for the town budgets, vote one for yes. If you're opposed, press two for no, or three to abstain. And I believe this is a majority vote, is that correct? Yep. Okay, voting is closed. And we'll cycle through all the screens on this. And it passes 194 in the affirmative, seven in the negative. Uh, it is a majority vote. So let's go through all the screens on this, because I don't know if we made it all the way through last time. 
and this is a pretty important vote. And while we're cycling through those, uh, when we get the, uh, in parallel with that, without changing the display, the, the presentation, do we, do we have a presentation for Capital Planet? Let, let's uh, make sure that's all ready to go. Great, thank you. So that brings us to Article 40, Capital Budget. Uh, Mr. Moore? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Christopher Moore, Precinct 14 and Chair of the Capital Planning Committee. I'm here to introduce our Article 40, the Capital Budget. Uh, uh, next slide, please. I will cover these five points, hopefully very rapidly, to uh, make good use of your time. Next slide, please. First of all, thanks. Capital planning in Arlington is a team sport, and I would like to thank everyone involved for their time, effort, consideration and flexibility. Uh, this year was a particularly tight year and a lot of people had to get not quite what they wanted. The work starts early each fall when town department heads come up with a list of all the capital purchases they think they need to deliver their programs for the next five years. After that, the committee members shown here meet in small groups with the department heads to ask questions about those projects and really understand what's driving them. Over the following months, the committee meets together to consider all the projects and balance the expenditures across the town. Special thanks uh, are due to our Deputy Town Manager for Finance, Alex McGee, Town Treasurer, Julie Wayman, and Vice Chair of the Committee, Timur Kaya Yantar. They were deeply involved with the production of the report, uh, and it wouldn't have happened without their numerous con contributions. Next slide, please. Now on to the report content. The first part of it is the vote. That's what we're really doing here tonight. That's detailed on pages one to five. It includes the acquisitions, the stuff we're buying, as well as debt service. You'll find all this stuff in the bright orange cover book. So for your information about what's coming in future years, we also include the five-year plan. That includes the, what we call the out years through fiscal year 2029. And in the appendices, we show a comprehensive list of every single item its cost, timing, and funding sources. Next slide, please. So how much are we spending? In fiscal year 2025, the cost of items to be acquired in the capital budget is $16.1 million. Those are documented in sections two, four, and five of the vote. The reason they're split up is they're paid for different ways. Uh, the different ways that we pay for things in the capital budget include cash, money that we collected from taxes, uh, bonding, which is where we borrow money in the, in the uh, capital markets, and other, which is a catch-all that means grants, donations, and enterprise funds. If you start looking into the details, public works is by far the largest at 53%. Um, and the big items there are roads, water and sewer rehabilitation work, sidewalks, accessibility projects, and something I'm sure we'll talk about later, uh, trash and recycling toters. Schools and school IT are about a third, 32%. Big items in that budget this year are envelope repairs, front office reconfiguration, and a solar array at Bishop, roof replacement and fire alarm upgrade at Hardy, exterior door replacement and a new playground at Bracket, and a lobby, lobby renovation and office addition at Stratton. Facilities is 5%. Big items there are the Robbins Library entrance stair rebuild and the town hall roof and clock tower work. Recreation is 5%. The big item there is Parallel Park, uh, which is being renovated. And everything else amounts to 6%, just under a million dollars. That includes non-school IT, community safety, planning, health and human services, libraries, purchasing, and the clerk's office. Some of these purchases will be made using cash. Some will be made funded using bonds. That's important, because when we vote to bond something, we're binding future town meetings to pay the bill, just as previous town meetings have bound this town meeting to pay for past purchases. Next slide, please. 
That brings me to debt service. How much are we paying for all those bills that we, uh, for things we bought in the past? This year, debt service for the town is $20 million. That's paid mostly by cash from the general tax. It covers expen um, principal and interest payments on prior year's bonds. That includes non-exempt debt uh, at about 37% and exempt debt at 63%. So exempt debt is debt that's authorized by vote of the town over and above the capital plan. The, the biggest example is uh, down the street on uh, Mass Ave Arlington High School. Um, Non-exempt debt is the debt that's authorized within the capital plan and does not increase our taxes. Next slide, please. As a town, we've long limited our capital budget to 5% of the overall town budget. And we've also limited the five-year capital plan to 5% of the projected town budget for the five years. This allows for long-term planning and fiscal discipline. The table at the top of this slide is from page 13 of the report. And the green boxes show that the net non-exempt capital plan is 10.27 million, which works out to just under 5% of the town's total budget for FY25. And that the overall plan is just over 5.00% of the projected budget for five years. Since the size of the capital plan is capped, if something gets added, something gets taken away. And that means that it either has to be removed, delayed, or reduced. Next slide, please. So this was the fast version of the capital budget. Uh, please read the report. <laughs> That's where all the details are. And we'd be glad to answer any of your questions uh, here or later. Uh, I'd also like to say that we are expecting an opening on the committee. Uh, so if you're interested in joining in this work, um, applications will be accepted soon, as soon as the moderator uh, posts it, uh, probably after we're all done with this meeting. Um, and we respectfully ask for your affirmative vote on Article 40. Thank you. Thank you. And I apologize for not opening the speaking queue before and showing that. So can we switch over to the speaker queue and we'll clear that so everyone gets a clean slate altogether. Apologies for that. So it's clear and it is now open. Okay, uh, let's take Mr. McSweeney. I don't think we've heard from him before. And then we'll take uh, Mr. Leone. Hi, uh, James McSweeney and Precinct 16. Sorry, I'm coming up here a little bit on a whim, um, but I didn't quite realize I was gonna have this opportunity. Um, on January 11th of this year, we had a, a freak storm um, that flooded our basement with municipal sewage, as well as my next door neighbor. And um, I hope this is within scope, but I, there, there was quite a, uh, an, a flux of water that somehow ended up in the sewer system. Um, we got somewhere between two and four inches of rain that night. Um, and about 11 inches of snow melt. And as we all, I think, are mostly aware, we are gonna be seeing more of these freak storms. Um, and I am, I'm concerned that our infrastructure is not prepared for that in this town. Um, how the sewage got into, how a mixture of stormwater and sewage got into our basement is, um, is sort of a mystery because we have separate stormwater and sewage systems from what I understand. Um, I mean, aside from <laughs> the disaster that this has been for our family and, you know, we have a finished basement, family members displaced for three months. Um, and this is the second year in a row this has happened to our next door neighbors. I'm sure that this has happened to multiple uh, residences around town. And um, yeah, so I guess my question is, is our capital planning for infrastructure taking into account um, the freak occurrences that are being caused by catastrophic climate change? Mr. Moore, do you have an answer? Or, or Mr. Rademacher? Yeah. Uh, Michael Rademacher, Director of Public Works, thank you. Um, so we do, we do make annual repairs to the sewer system. Uh, we have a pretty robust program where we annually inspect 
a certain section of town and then we will design improvements and then make, um, make those necessary repairs. And the majority of that work is focused on keeping groundwater out of the sewer lines. Uh, when we have a wet season like we have had, groundwater levels rise, clean water finds its way into cracks and defects in the pipe and takes away some of the capacity that was intended for sewage and, and, and the consequences, unfortunately, you, as you witnessed. Um, so the 100% the, the of our um, sewer capital, about a million dollars a year, goes to making these types of repairs. Uh, in addition to that, we are also embarking on a program to uh, investigate and have sources of sump pump, clean water, people's basements that are potentially inadvertently or, or intentionally connected to the sewer, disconnected. It's a violation of plumbing code, and we are now looking at reducing that um, as well. So I agree we have some work to do, and uh, we are concentrating the majority of our funds on, on just the problem you identified. That's very good to hear. So is, I think it's safe to assume that these old pipes have a lot of cracks, and I've seen video of the water literally gushing in, clean water getting in there. And so therefore, a big storm event can create this surge. It's hard to imagine how it created such a, so much pressure in the system, but I, I suppose that that is a possible answer. I guess my only follow-up question is, are, are the pipes getting any bigger, <laughs> or are we assuming that, that simply getting rid of the cracks is gonna create enough additional surplus? Sure, the pipes don't need to get bigger. They, they need to be repaired and used only for the intent which way they, for which they were designed. So when we can, what we do is we, we find the, the most offending pipes and we actually put a liner in them and that seals up the cracks uh, and that'll prevent the, uh, the groundwater from getting in. But the, where we need cooperation from uh, homeowners and, and residences are the sources that come from private properties, uh, sump pumps, gutters, uh, floor drains that Back in the day, it was acceptable to connect, or it may have been at one point acceptable. It is no longer, and we need to remove those because that's when you have a large storm event and you have those direct connections is where you see the, the largest problem. So we really need to remove those sources. Right. It seems like there might have been some yeah. actual direct connections just given the volume. And um, so thank you. Thank you for answering the questions. Thank I you. just... Uh, Obviously, it's a personal issue for me, but it's also an issue because the town is ultimately liable for this type of um, sewer discharge into people's homes. So it does impact the overall budget of the town as well. And obviously, everyone wants to be able to have functioning homes and not to deal with this stuff. So thank you all for Thank you. I'll take Mr. Leone next. And Mr. McSweeney, thank you for not showing pictures. And then we'll take Mr. Joshua. I'm sorry, Mr. Arnold. John Leone, Precinct 8. You're right, Chris. I do have a question. A million and a half dollars on trash toters. What are they and how come? Mr. Moore? I'll start. Okay. The uh, million and a half dollars for trash toter is, is, to, is to have the town uh, outfit every residence in the town with a both a recycling and a solid waste uh, receptacle that can be used with an automated collection system. Um, <laughs> and the reason to do that is to support the town's efforts for an affordable trash contract. Now, we don't know yet whether that will, in fact, be something we need to do in order to get an affordable trash contract. So we're putting ourselves in the position where that's an option. Oh, so if we get one, then we're going to get the toters? That's my understanding, is we would not actually buy the toters unless they're going to save us money. These, these big things on the big wheels with the metal bar? Yes. One per household for? I believe there would be two, one for trash and one for recycling. And what if I have more trash than fits in the toter? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Mr. Feeney, do you want to join the comedy team here? <laughs> Jim Feeney, town manager. I don't think it's turned on. Is it on? Try again. It's on. 
green light. Okay. Hello? Yes. Hello? Yeah. yeah. I don't think it was on. You were right. Yeah. <laughs> so if in fact we did move forward with trash toters, and again, we would only do that if it were advantageous for the town to move towards automation. It may not be the case. We're going to be bidding out this contract in a number of different ways to try to make it so that we can, frankly, afford it, but still provide the level of service that Arlington's residents are accustomed to. If, in fact, you needed more trash than would be provided by the toter, and again, toters come in different sizes, you would have the ability to get another toter or potentially overflow bags. So there are a number of different systems that could be implemented to account for that. Right. So I know some households have many people and they won't fit everything in the one. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Um, I had another question about on budget two. Number 2.10, 70,000 modernization agendas and minutes under IT. Is that? I could speak to it or IT director could speak yeah. to it. Sure. <laughs> director Shepard? interesting it's the first time anybody's used that title with me so thank you Greg <laughs> good evening everyone Patricia Shepard chief information officer information technology so currently what we do to run meetings like this is we use Novus agenda correct to both collect no, a microphone uh, folks are just asking for you to talk into the microphone oh so sorry yeah so right into it there we go yeah better okay. um, so currently the tool that we are using, Novus Agenda, is gonna be retired by the vendor, Granicus. Oh, okay. So I've been working both with our public information officer, Joan Roman, and with our clerk, Julie Brazil, to look at what the evolution of that will be. Um, we're calling it modernization of agendas and minutes, but we really have to look for a new platform to do all of this, and also looking at it through the lens of how do we increase people's access, meaning the public, to be able to give comment, see the comments that are being shared, et cetera. Um, there's a lot that could happen here. We're actually just demoing different tools now, knowing that the tool is slated to be retired in 12 to 18 months. Will it hopefully speed up the time frame between when the minutes happen, when the meeting happens, the minutes get posted? It's because sometimes it's either months or weeks and weeks or months between the two, which makes it hard for us to. Oh, sorry. I know there's a lot of conversation out here. I just want to make sure I answer the question. Yeah. So I wish that I could answer that specifically, but my staff are not the ones responsible for posting to the system. So I don't have a lot of insight into that business mm. process. But my assumption is some of this stuff has to be manual. And depending on how we run our meetings and how we record them, we might be able to get those deliverables up there for consumption, not necessarily in real time, but closer to real time, because when you talk about months, then that information has grown very, very stale and has probably changed. Yeah, so. that's why we need it quicker. Okay, thank you. So that's excellent feedback, thank you. Great, thank you. And I have one more question. Uh, town hall renovations, is that the roof over the lion's? Renovations, is that the roof over the lion's hearing room? And the cupola that leaks? Hopefully not anymore. <laughs> Thank Mr. you, Mr. Feeney? Moderator. Jim Feeney, Town Manager. So, uh, actually, fairly soon, the cupola will be getting taken down off the building and roofed over under a Community Preservation Act grant. And the money you see in the capital plan will be put towards immediately making repairs to what we know as the Lions Hearing Room so that it can be uh, returned to use Very for good. town meetings and functions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And. Let's see, the next speaker drop off the list. Uh, that would, let's see, let's take uh, Mr. Lane next. Adam Lane, Precinct 3. I move to terminate debate. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. Uh, all those in favor of terminating debate on Article 40, say yes. Yes. All those opposed, say no. No. It is not terminated. Uh, let's see, let's go to 
Okay, so let's take an electronic vote. Uh, we have not opened voting yet, so a lot of folks are entering the speaker queue right now. Okay, there we go. Okay. Green light is on, voting is open. If you're in favor of terminating, de terminating debate on Article 40, the capital budget, uh, press one for yes. If you wanna continue debate, press two for no. Okay, let's close voting. And debate is terminated. So we will go to a vote on the main motion, the capital budget. And let's see, do we have a total here, Mr. Moore? I, from the Finance Committee report, I saw the total of 23,900,000. Does that sound right? Right. But do we have like a, a total for everything or? How about this? Uh, I'm not gonna give you a figure because it's likely to be wrong, so um, we're voting on the main motion of Article 40, which is the recommended vote of the Capital Planning Committee, and it is a two-thirds vote. Okay, voting is now open. If you're in favor of the recommended vote of the Capital Planning Committee for Article 40 for the capital budget, uh, press one for yes. If you're opposed to the recommended vote from the Capital Planning Committee, press two for no, or three to abstain. And this is a two-thirds vote. Okay, voting is closed. And it passes, 205 in the affirmative, four in the negative, and one abstention. That brings us uh, well, um, before it brings us to another article, Ms. Deschler, um, I believe we have some articles to remove from a table somewhere. Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. I move that the undisposed articles uh, 29 through 38 be removed from the table. Second. Okay, we have a motion to remove the undisposed articles between 29 and uh, the budgets um, uh, and a second. Uh, all those in favor, say yes. yes. All those opposed? It is unanimous. We are back now at Article 29. Uh, this is Zoning Bylaw Amendment Reduced Height Buffer. Uh, Ms. Zember, you want to lead us off? Oh, and actually, before we get started, before I start the clock, uh, can we show, sorry to switch around here, can we show the speaker queue uh, and clear that and everyone could see if they get their requests in? Let's see. Are we able to switch over? There, here we go. One second. And we'll show it in just a moment. And there it is. Here's the clear speaker queue. And if you, if you want to speak on this article, you can, you can uh, click your um, handset. Okay, let's switch back to the presentation. Sorry, Ms. Zembury. Okay, it's all yours. Go Great. Ahead. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Hello, I'm Rachel Zemberry, Chair of the Arlington Redevelopment Board, and I'll be taking you through Warren Article 29, the Reduced Height Buffer for 2024 Annual Town Meeting. Next slide. Article 29 proposes to reduce the height buffer distances required when two different heights are specified for the same zoning district. In the Arlington Zoning Bylaw, height buffers are used to minimize shadows from taller buildings from falling on properties located in the R0, R1, R2, and open space districts. However, the height buffer distances in the current bylaw, originally set in 1975, when taller buildings were allowed by the zoning bylaw, reflect building heights that are no longer allowable in, the, uh, in several zoning districts. Given that the overall height maximums have been reduced, the required height buffer distances should likewise be reduced, and this article would reduce the applicable buffer distances by 50%. 
This article reduces the buffer distances to reflect the current allowable building heights and would add greater clarity as to the size of the minimum buffer. It also clarifies the language to reflect the ability of the redevelopment board to permit the upper level, excuse me, the upper limit if it finds that it, could not, it would not be detrimental to adjacent properties in alignment with the safeguards included in the special permit criteria. Next slide. This drawing illustrates that without this change, many buildings are required to be much shorter than the height limit of their district. In fact, the current setbacks essentially prohibit a building from being constructed to the allowable heights that have been otherwise set, reviewed, and approved by town meeting for our zoning bylaws. This discourages projects that might otherwise match the zoning bylaws intentions for those districts due to the small lot sizes that exist across our zoning districts. So, uh, next slide. The proposed amendment to the language includes, next slide, a reduction to the buffer distances to reflect the current allowable building heights and would add greater clarity as to the size of the minimum buffer. A note again that this article only refers to the buffer distances required when two different heights are specified for the same zoning district. The redevelopment board retains the authority to allow the higher height limit if they determine that it would not have detrimental impact based on environmental design review criteria and the special permit criteria in section 3.3 and 3.4. Next slide. The amendment makes the new bu uh, buffer height area clear in, table, in this table of section 5.3.19. The ARB voted five to zero at our April 1st meeting to rec recommend favorable action on article 29. Thank you. Thank you. And let's see. Um, I see Mr. Newton in the queue um, and Pi Fisher in the queue. Um, they've now disappeared. We have no speakers in the queue and we have no amendments. Uh, Mr. Wagner? I see you now. Yeah, you just showed up here. Yep, Mr. Wagner? I, I can see the queue at all times, even when presentations are up. Um, uh, so we have Mr. Wagner and then Mr. Holman. You're in now. There was a period where the queue was empty, and then now both Mr. Wagner and Mr. Holman are in the queue, and we'll take those two speakers in that order. Mr. Wagner? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Carl Wagner, Precinct 15. Um, could we have the slide with the house, the car, and the buildings up again, please? I think there was a car. The diagram? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'd like to point out that uh, we are still awaiting all the changes that the MBTA density overlay is going to make. And people are not even aware that those changes are going to go through. These changes are said in the text that precedes this slide that 1975 uh, resulted in a big change in zoning and now we need to make changes because of 75. Well, that's like 50 years ago and we just had MBTA densities go through. I think we should probably admit the 50 years could be 52 or 53. I think we should probably not do this right now. And I'd like to draw attention because it took me a long time to understand what the buffer areas are. The buffer areas are like a DMZ between North Korea and South Korea, between the, the larger, uh, taller, more typically uh, commercial areas with big office type buildings and then residences, apartments, single and two family units that are the house. Um, they're proposing changes that could make two or more floors, I think, because you can have six floors in some of the, the businesses, I think. They're proposing bringing those buildings closer, essentially, losing the, uh, the area that you see grayed out in the lower uh, picture there. What it means is uh, loss of, of sun exposure for solar panels, because we don't have any protections for solar panels for the residences nearby. Loss of uh, open space potentially, or at least shading of open space. And I, I ask myself, is this a good thing for Arlington right now? Um, I, I hope others have other thoughts to, to mention on it. I would also point out that it might even be unnecessary to do this because I believe that the board has uh, decision capability to go beyond what the law says when they want to for uh, an appeal or for a developer who asks. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Holman and then Mr. Borden. Thank you. 
Aram Holman, precinct. Aram Holman, uh, precinct six. Uh, I have some questions as well as some statements. Um, I took a look at the code. Uh, I'm reading. I'm sorry, could you step maybe like a couple inches away from the speaker or from the microphone? That might help. Sorry about that. Um, I'm, I'm reading here that um, a height buffer is defined as a lot or part of a lot which is located at a lesser distance from any land not within a public way in an R0, R1, 2, or OS district than the following. I have a couple of questions. I've read this many, many times, and in the absence of your diagram, I can't understand it. And so my first question is, should we have in our bylaws things which most people can understand? Second, also a question, uh, it says the lower height shall apply, and then it specifies different directions, northwest, northeast, easterly, between northeast, uh, southeast. Can you explain why the different height buffers apply in different directions? I'm really at a loss here. Uh, Mr. Revelak? Um, would diagrams be something we could do in the zoning bylaw and why the directional, right? So I, I, there were diagrams at one point. I'm not, I guess maybe they were taken out, but anyway, I, you know, I, I understand Mr. Holland's point that why do we have things in the bylaw that are difficult for people to understand? And I kind of take that. Um, but really, this one is about sun exposure. So we are in the Northern Hemisphere. So if you are, if, you know, the sun will cast a larger shadow on the northern side of a building than on the southern. And the ones on the east and west tend to be you know, about, about balanced. So when the bylaw talks about a, you know, the current buffer distance of 100 feet between southwesterly and southeasterly, they're really talking about like the southern quadrant of a circle. Ditto for you know, the parts between northwesternly and northeasterly. That's 200 feet. Again, southern exposure puts a, puts a bigger shadow on the northern side of the building. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you, you. Thank you very much. Um, I also took a look. I was looking for the definition of a height buffer, and uh, there is a section in the bylaw for definitions. There is no definition of height buffer within the section of the bylaw for definitions. The only definition is right here. I'm just wondering, why didn't anybody bother to put this in the definitions? It isn't there. Sure, Steve Revelak. Uh, in 2018, Arlington did recodify its zoning bylaw, and we did make an effort to improve upon the definitions. But at this, this one just never came up, perhaps because there's an entire section that devotes, de devoted to explaining it. So it wasn't there uh, before, and it isn't there now, and yet people need to look for this. Ultimately, as you said, this is a debate over whether for smaller houses you can build additional floors uh, beyond the third story, and the real issue is to what extent you're gonna take people's sun. And I'm looking at this, and be it for solar panels or even without solar panels, I don't think we should be taking people's sun like that, particularly when you have buildings, houses, residences that have been there a long, long time. If these were houses which had just been built 20 years ago, that might be different. But you are changing a fundamental status quo here, and I don't think most people want their sun and their light taken away, and I respectfully urge you to vote against this. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take uh, Mr. Morden and then Mr. Newton. So it sounds like if the earth gets knocked off axis, we might have to correct those directions in the zoning bylaw. Is that right? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, uh, is this working? Yes. yes. Okay. <clears throat> um, John Worden, Precinct 8. Um, uh, as, uh, uh, when, when the zoning bylaw was, uh, when, when the buffer was put in back in 1975, the recodification, um, 
Nobody had ever heard of solar panels. But um, time has moved on, and, and solar panels are proliferating uh, very much so. And I, I had uh, two of my sons were in, in business related to solar panels, so I, I know a little bit more about it than I used to, anyway. Um, but the, 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 the point is that the, uh, we're talking about sustainability and environment and, uh, and all this sort of thing and not burning fossil fuels to make electricity. So solar panels are, are given a lot of people a lot of independence from, from the fossil fuel um, that otherwise we use to turn on <coughs> all the lights we have here and so on. Um, so the, it becomes much more important, perhaps, uh, to not block the sunlight from anybody's house as it exists now or as it may exist uh, later and in a, in a, in a, they build a new house on the same lot or something like that. And, and so it seems to me uh, the, 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 um, the, the fact that buildings may, may get taller or buildings used to be taller uh, we have a lot of buildings that are taller than our present five feet, uh, five feet, <laughs> I wish, five stories, uh, that, um, th that that was kind of the maximum uh, in the 1970, <coughs> 78 and 79 uh, uh, reforms to the height, li height limits. So um, I want to just particularly uh, uh, be sure that uh, that the any anything that changes that buffer area is carefully calculated to not in any possible way uh, cast a, a shadow or, or block the sunlight from anybody's solar panels. And I don't see how you can do that when, when, when we don't even know how high buildings are going to be. And so I, I would respectfully suggest that, that we keep, keep the buffers the way they are, don't pass this, this uh, proposed change, and I mean, it's, it's worked for, it's worked for uh, 50 years. Uh, let's give it another 50 years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Newton, and then Pi Fisher. Sanjay Newton, <clears throat> excuse me, Sanjay Newton, Precinct 10. Um, I have a, a couple of questions um, and perhaps a comment. Um, the, Change here to the reduced height buffer area mentions that it applies when two different height maximum limits are specified. Um, could you perhaps tell me which zones that is? Mr. Revelock or Ms. Zenberry? Steve Revelock, Arlington Redevelopment Board. It applies to a number of uses in the B districts, which are located predominantly along Mass Ave and Broadway. There's a couple, you know, on Summer Street and you know, nearby, but it, it's mostly the corridors and, um, yeah, it does not apply to the industrial districts. Thank you. Uh, uh, a, a previous speaker mentioned that we should perhaps wait because we just did MBTA communities. Is there any interaction between what we're doing here and MBTA communities? Uh, yes. Okay. So although MBTA communities does not have the criteria of, it doesn't meet the criteria of having uh, a height dimension with two limits. But there is a section in there that says uh, that at six, at the sixth story is subject to the height buffers. So in the case of six stories under the uh, under our MBTA community zoning would be Mass Ave, um, and that would be someone building a mixed use building uh, and trying to take advantage of a two story uh, bonus for you know either doing commercial or doing very sustainable development or doing extra affordable housing, but it would apply at the six, to the sixth story. Great. So it would be fair to say that. Passing this amendment increases our chances of getting new commercial development. Get, oh, it would be fair to say that passing this amendment increases our probability or our possibility of getting new commercial development in town. Well, I don't know. So I would hope that it would be new mixed use sure. because yep. commer, you know, mixed me. use yes. is generally on the bottom. Yes. But um, one of the things that applicants before the redevelopment board typically say is that they're really interested in building residential, and this applies to the upper heights, which are that's that's where your residential would go. So yeah, this this would hopefully per, um, encourage more mixed use development and allow more residential units. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you will uh, vote in support of this um, amendment, and uh, thank you.
Great, we'll take Pi Fisher and then Mr. Lewicki. Pi Fisher, Precinct 6, motion to terminate debate. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate. Second. We have a second. All those in favor of terminating debate on Article 29, say yes. Yes. All those opposed, say no. No. Debate is not terminated. Uh, we'll go to Miss. Okay, we'll take a, an electronic vote. Okay, voting is open. If you wish to terminate debate, press one. If you want to continue debate, press two. And now I feel bad for scolding everyone earlier because you're actually using a reasonable volume and I'm still getting it wrong. Okay, debate is terminated, wow. Uh, 151 in the affirmative, 15 negative. So we'll move to a, uh, a vote on the main motion. Point of order, Point of order. Mr. Revlock. Steve Revlock, praising one. Mr. Moderator, is this a 50% or a two thirds vote? It's a two, two thirds vote, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, for the main motion, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, it is a, it is a majority vote, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was initially listed, at least in my notes, as majority, and I think I changed it to two thirds. I mean, um, based on advice from council. So this is a two thirds vote. So let's go to a vote on. I'm sorry. It says it right here. It is a majority vote. Thank you. So, okay, let's. Voting is open and we'll leave it open for a little bit longer because of the confusion. Uh, we're voting on the main motion of Article 29 to amend Section 5319, reduced height buffer area subsection A in the zoning bylaw to alter the height buffer requirements. If you're in favor of that change, uh, pre press one for yes. If you're opposed to that change in the zoning bylaw, press two for no or three to abstain. And this is a majority vote. Okay, let's close voting. And it passes, 131 in the affirmative, 70 in negative, one abstention. Yeah, so let, let's, uh, yeah, Mr. Cunningham, do you wanna explain why, uh, why it's a majority vote? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Cunningham, Town Council. Yes, pursuant to the legislature's changes to Chapter 48, Section 5 in the year 2000, specifically provides guidance on when uh, zoning bylaw changes that were normally subject to two-thirds votes are now majority, specifically when the bylaw provides for changes in dimensional standards such as lot coverage or floor area ratio, height, setbacks, minimum open space coverage, parking, building coverage to allow for the construction of additional residential units on a particular parcel or parcels of land are subject to majority vote. Yeah, and just Mr. Cunningham, just so, so we're clear, if, um, uh, if the Attorney General's office says that we got it wrong, what happens? The vote would be nullified, we'd have to redo, but uh, I'm fairly confident based on the guidance provided by the state and the changes in the law that that is accurate. Thank you. Okay, that takes us to Article 30. Point of order, Mr. Holman. Aaron Holman, Precinct 6. Uh, I'd like to request that for zoning related amendments, uh, the requisite half or two thirds uh, be posted on any motions and also announced in advance, just so everybody knows in advance. Thank you. Um, it takes us to Article 30. Um, let's, uh, can we show the speaker queue and then we'll clear that for anyone who wishes uh, to speak on Article 30.
There we go. Okay. And so, Ms. Zember. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Rachel Zemberry, Chair of the Redevelopment Board. Article 30 is a proposed zoning bylaw amendment related to shading parking lots inserted by Susan Stamps. The board was split on their support of this article. Those in favor of this article felt that while the town would work to increase the tree canopy on public property by planting trees, this article is a reasonable requirement for private property owners to add to the tree canopy as well. Those who were opposed to the article felt that the amendment was overly prescriptive given the small parcels and irregular lot configurations in Arlington and placed unnecessary burden on the developers. The ARB voted three to two at their April 1st meeting to recommend favorable action on Article 30. Thank you. Thank you. And I will now invite uh, Ms. Stamps, who has a presentation and also an amendment. And Ms. Carr Jones. Uh, Susan Stamps, Precinct 3. Mr. Moderator, mm -hmm. may I ask to extend for two minutes to, for the amendment in case we uh, use up all the time for the presentation? So for a total of nine minutes, just in, in case? Yes. Uh, okay, so we have a request. Hopefully we won't need it. Uh, an extension of an additional two minutes to a total of nine if needed. Uh, all those in favor of the extension say yes. yes. All those opposed say no. The extension is granted, nine minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm Elizabeth Carr Jones, Precinct 14, and this is Susan Stamps, Precinct 3. We're here representing Green Streets Arlington, a group of volunteers from the Tree Committee, Open Space Committee, Conservation Commission, and Finance Committee. We came together during the MBTA communities process to advocate for measures to mitigate climate change and enrich Arlington's natural environment. And we worked with the ARB to craft their recommended vote on this article. Next slide, please. As a community, we recognize the benefits of a more livable environment, green shady streets, great quality of life, and welcoming local businesses. We also recognize the importance of climate change, climate change resilience, and seek ways to reduce excess heat and flooding and improve our air quality. In 2010, Arlington was designated one of the first green communities in Massachusetts. Sustainability has been woven into our town's fabric for a long time. Next slide, please. Now let me stress the urgency of now. Global temperatures are rising, and show, as shown in this graph, from 1880 to 2020. And this heat map of Arlington from Mystic River Watershed Association's Wicked Hot Mystic Project shows a pattern of higher temperatures shown in red in areas with more pavement and fewer trees and the lowest temperatures in our few areas of forest. Next slide, please. Using Google Maps, we counted roughly 70 parking lots in Arlington with more than 25 spaces. They serve our larger businesses, residential buildings, schools, and town centers. Here are a few examples. Top left is CVS beside the high school. Top right is top, Stop and Shop. Bottom left is Russell Common in the center. And the bottom right is the Thompson School, which at 26 spaces is the smallest parking lot this amendment would have applied to. Now Susan will walk you through the details. Next slide, please. Thank you, Elizabeth. Susan Stamps, Precinct 3. Can you hear me OK? I'll try to keep my voice up. We're proposing an amendment to zoning section 6.1.11 D6 to require shade in parking lots with more than 25 spaces, not small parking lots, but big ones over 25 spaces, including parking lots that are expanded to more than 25 spaces. Section 6.1.D6 requires, already requires landscaped areas in at least 8% of the total paved portion of parking lots over 25 spaces. But normally, as I'm sure you've noticed, that landscaping is bushes and other low plantings that don't provide shade. However, another section of our zoning bylaw that I didn't know about requires heat mitigation in the industrial district including shading with trees or solar panels as an option. Building on the work that has already been done on greening our industrial, 
parking, our amendment extends these shading concepts to the residential and business districts. Next slide, please. Our proposed amendments to 6.1.11D6 D add the requirement that shade must be provided in those large parking lots by trees and or solar panels. If trees are used, they must be, there must be one tree planted for every eight parking spaces with some part of every parking space no more than 32 feet from a tree. If you graph this out in a parking lot, you'll see that when the tree gets a big canopy at maturity, it's gonna be covering probably about 50% of the area that the tree's in. The other option that can be done separately or combined with trees are solar canopies over parking spaces to cover at least 50% of the area where they're located in the parking lot. In addition, the amendment includes language developed with the tree warden to ensure that contractors choose appropriate shade trees and take care of them, including watering for the first three years. <clears throat> My favorite part, <laughs> as a member of the tree committee. Let's see how this might work in the Whole Foods parking lot. Next slide, please. On the left is an aerial view of what we have with our current zoning. 81 parking spaces, no shade trees, and no solar panels. On the right is a simulation of what we could have had with this bylaw amendment had it been in place when that parking lot was put in. Here we've used a 50-50 combination of trees and solar canopy to get over, to get 80 parking spaces, only one less than we started with, but with the addition of five shade trees and 192 solar panels. Few, if any, parking spaces would be lost with this amendment because the already required 8% landscape area creates a lot of room for trees, and solar canopies are typically built to fit neatly over the rows with minimal footprint. Next slide, please. There are so far just a few cities and towns across the country, we found, that require shade in parking lots but you can be sure they'll be increasing. One of those is Los Angeles, and another one is our neighboring town of Lexington, which uses a formula similar to the one in this bylaw. We hope that Arlington Town Meeting will continue its tradition of voting for Arlington being a leader in climate resilience and sustainability. Trees and solar panels both provide huge environmental benefits. Our parking lots are heat islands now. They will only get hotter. This amendment provides an easy method endorsed by a majority of the redevelopment board to make our town greener, cooler, and more livable. Please vote yes on Article 30. Thank you, and we're glad to take your questions. And Ms. Stamps, do you have a, an amendment to offer? Um, there's a copy of this amendment on the back table, hopefully, or hopefully you've, or you've got it in your annotated warrant, but it's just two changes. They're just language changes. There's no sub substantive change. The first is in, um, at the end of paragraph D6, before subparagraphs A and B, replace the words for shading requirements in industrial districts C 6.1.11 F with the words for shading requirements in industrial districts C 6.1.11 F semicolon the below subparagraphs A and B are applicable to parking lots in the residential and business districts. And then the second um, the second amendment uh, would be in D6, uh, let's see, subparagraph B, to delete the last sentence, uh, this provision is applicable to parking lots in the residential and business districts. So in short, it's just to clarify, it's, uh, it, it's applying the provision to that, uh, to paragraph D6, uh, uh, rather than just one of the sub-items B. 
Yeah, it's kind of, it sort of creates an ambiguity the way it's written now and this clarifies it. And so can, uh, can you move your amendment in 30 seconds? Uh, so I'd like to move that, um, that the meeting vote for this amendment that I just explained. But to, to put the, put the, uh, the amendment before the meeting. Um, yeah. uh, we have a second. It is now pending before us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And from the speaker queue, let's see, we have um, Ms. Bloom, I think, hasn't spoken yet. Uh, yeah, let's, can we show the speaker here, Ms. Ms. Bloom, and then we'll take uh, Mr. Newton. Uh, just a small question. Does this only pertain to parking lots that will be built, or does this pertain to all parking lots that are already there? I'm sorry, uh, name and precinct, please. Oh, Nancy Bloom, precinct 18. Apologies. Uh, Ms. Carr-Jones or Ms. Stamps? Uh, Elizabeth Carr-Jones, uh, precinct 14. As we understand it, this would only apply to new parking lots that are 25 spaces or more, or parking lots that have been expanded to 25 spaces or more. Um, I don't know if it applies to any other parking lots. Okay, thank you. Mr. Newton. Sanjay Newton, Sanjay Newton, Precinct 10. Um, could you bring up in the presentation, uh, there was a slide early on that showed several parking lots. I think it was maybe slide four or five. I didn't count exactly. Uh, um, while they're finding that, uh, I had a question for the ARB on whether they have a thought about the amendment we're being offered. Ms. Zember. Rachel Zemberry, Chair of the Redevelopment Board. The Redevelopment Board has not met to formally discuss or um, provide an opinion on the amendment. Okay. Um, perhaps the Chair might have an opinion on, on her own, or uh, that's fine. I'll leave it at that. Um, okay. We have these pictures. So what do we see in these pictures? All these parking lots have many, many, many empty spaces. Um, so. I would, <laughs> a shaded parking lot is fine, um, but from a climate standpoint, from a heat island standpoint, not having a parking lot that large would be much, 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 much better. Um, so I will, this is the amendment we have before us, so I will reluctantly vote for it, but I, I would ask you to think very hard in the future when we have opportunities to reduce our parking requirements, that would be 10 times better than what we're doing here today. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see, let's skip down, take Mr. Hop and then Mr. Cook. Uh, Mr. Cook. And then uh, we'll go back to the top, Mr. Jameson. Grant Cook, Precinct 16. Is I guess a question for Ms. Stamps. Um, if you could put the Whole Foods lot back up. I guess the question is, have you watched them pull a truck into that lot? <laughs> I have, and it involves cones and cutting sections off, bringing it, I think it would take out the solar panels um, as it comes around. It's, uh, just have you considered that, because it's, maybe they can plan around it, but there's other factors than my little Ford Fusion in parking lots. Uh, Elizabeth Carjones, Precinct 14. Um, obviously, this is one of only of many possibilities for the way this the way this could have been applied to a parking lot. Um, one of the things that this parking lot had going for it, in terms of us using it as an example, is it's relatively simple and um, not really. And and the, well, compared to Stop and Shop or some of the other ones. Uh, it's relatively simple and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to visualize where, where the trees would go. And if it had been designed with this in mind, um, I think it would have been much, much clearer. 
uh, how to deal with things like that. In other words, right now the, the solar panels are right over the um, paved, paved center section. So I don't know if trucks actually they drive use, over that. Yeah, they, but, they yeah. skew into the, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it, designing with this in mind would probably get a better result than uh, what we have here. Okay, okay thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jamison and uh, Ms. Garber. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Gordon Jamison, Precinct 12. So this is only for future projects, as I heard. What happens if somebody repaves their parking lot and then relines it in a different fashion? Uh, Ms. Stamps. This does not re uh, apply to repaving or any kind of reconstruction. Other than new parking lots, it only applies when you have an existing parking lot and you expand it to more than 25 spaces. So what happens if I have a big lot and I decide I wanna expand my shop and then I reduce the size of the parking, parking lot? Nothing? Uh, I, that wouldn't apply because this only of this section of the zoning bylaw only applies to parking lots over 25 spaces. So if they're, um, if they're, if they're 75 and they're suddenly 50, it doesn't make them do that. Ms. Mr. Cunningham may have an answer. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Cunningham, Town Council. I think the proponents have accurately stated that this will not apply to new construction it would not apply to, in my view, the language, it would not apply if there were a parking lot that reduced its size from 75 to 60. Uh, it would not apply to parking lots that, uh, you know, anything that's existing now. This would be new parking lots. Yeah, so, is, so my further question is, so let's take the, the Walgreens in East Arlington. Is this going to, um, they have a huge lot, and uh, they might want to uh, sell part of it and build a, a storefront uh, in the front of that, is this going to uh, pre pre preclude them from doing that or can they do that and they still don't have to put up any shade trees or solar panels? This would be, obviously these determinations are very fact specific. If there were a new owner, arguably that would, the provisions would apply. If it's an existing owner who's just remodeling and reducing their lot size from a figure over the 25 amount to you know, if they're already at 50 and they reduce it to 40, this would not be applicable. Uh, so, okay, so I'm, I'm in favor of this as long as it doesn't uh, reduce the potential for new growth. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I believe there's Ms. Garber next. And then we'll take uh, Ms. Kepka. Judith Garber, Precinct 4. Um, so in the report, it said that some members of the redevelopment board were concerned uh, or, or said that in the past they've been able to just figure things out with the developer instead of changing the whole law. But my question is, if this were to pass, would the redevelopment board be able to then work with developers if there was an irregular lot size or something to get some kind of solution passed that would work for them? Ms. Zember? Rachel Zemberry, Chair of the Redevelopment Board. Um, I think the, those Redevelopment Board members who uh, did not vote in favor of this were concerned that it would be more restrictive and um, that it would be challenging. It would, it would, it would uh, present more challenges to come up with a creative solution for those areas where the regular lot sizes where perhaps there might be other solutions such as rain gardens, et cetera, where perhaps large shade trees were not appropriate. Okay, so do you think, in your opinion, this would make it more difficult for a development to happen because someone might be concerned that they won't be able to plant all the shade trees that they would have to? I, I think it's, uh, it's another challenging requirement. Par parking lots are tight, and our, um, our developers, when they look at, at um, developing a parcel in Arlington, they work with the redevelopment board to reduce the size of those parking lots as much as possible. Um, and uh, we appreciate that. Um, 
within the uh, requirements that we have. Adding another requirement that again takes, um, that, that adds one more requirement um, that's very prescriptive is another way that, that that space keeps getting cut up in um, more, more and more um, prescriptive areas rather than looking to find a, a creative solution that might be 7% of you know, the, the land. So it's, um, it's, it's again, it's one more requirement on that very small open space that we have uh, available to the developers. All right, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Kepka? And then Ms. Carlton Giesen. Asha Kepka, Precinct One. I think this is a wonderful idea. And I know a lot of the developers here are sort of standard, let's cut all the trees, let's build, maximize the buildings. Um, I see this parking lot with the solar panels, and I'm thinking this is a great revenue source. So a, de a, a creative developer um, will create a parking lot where they can draw money from having the solar panels. Um, everybody who's, let's say, visiting this mixed-use, let's say, complex would love to park under this uh, shade. Um, I could see um, a market, Sunday market, being uh, utilized in this empty parking lot. Um, we do have empty parking lot uh, right of Route 60 that could be turned into art market, could be a place for people to perform. Here you could have a roof that uh, draws uh, from the sun, creates the revenue, could be a beer market, could be art market, it could benefit the town, um, it could be a great place for people to hang out. We don't have many shady areas where people can just lounge and listen to music. Um, I am a little jaded um, because I do realize our um, uh, redevelopment board, um, basically even if we create this amendment, uh, would be very lenient towards the developers who can come in and say um, this is unfeasible or too expensive. Um, and I know they've uh, been given a great leeway to the builders. Um, there's a, a complex, mixed-use complex, or apartment building, next to Stop and Shop, where the builder committed to one single tree. And that tree is gone three years or four years after the, uh, the building uh, was constructed. Um, the one single tree that the builder committed is gone. And um, I don't think there is an enforcement to keep the builders to the word. So um, I think if we consider ourselves sustainable, we should choose things that are right, not uh, a diff you know just because they're slightly difficult and inconvenient doesn't mean they are not right. And I highly support this amendment. Thank you. Um, I have no recollection of where I was in the speaker queue because uh, I've jumped around all over the place. Um, mm, uh, Mr. Cook, you already, you already spoke. Okay, I get. It. Can we clear the uh, speakers after they speak? Um, eventually, uh, Mr. Jones, you're close to a podium. You're next. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Alan Jones, Precinct 14, and I was part of this team to do that. Uh, I am on the Finance Committee, but this has nothing to do with the Finance Committee. Um, I just wanted to really reiterate what you might have missed that Susan said about what space this takes. Now, because it's for new or effectively new parking lots, you're always starting with a blank slate. You're saying, you know, a blank piece of paper. We've talked to developers and landscape designers, and they sort of said, it's not a problem, you know, nickels and dimes. And if you go through the geometry, if you draw what eight spaces and the aisle and the sidewalks and stuff take, it's, I think, 2240 square feet if you just do a simple calculation. And a six-foot diameter tree pit that covers that space, one for every eight spaces, is like 28 square feet. Bottom line is you can easily cover, if you're doing all trees, with, you know, 30-foot shade trees, it takes one to two percent of the landscape space out of the 8% that's already required. So there's a lot of flexibility in there to fit it into a brand new parking lot. Um, and then 
And I guess the only other thing I wanted to say is this isn't just tree hugger stuff. It actually makes better parking lots for us who use the parking lots. And I just ask you, when you go into a parking lot on a hot day, you're driving in, what do you look for? You look for a tree to park under. You know, it's a better, more comfortable parking lot. It should be better for business and residences and raise the rents and whatever, but it's a better parking lot for us who use them. So I hope you vote for it. Thank you. Thank you. But it is still tree hugger stuff, though, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, we'll take Mrs. Mozina next from the, from the satellite room. To terminate debate. Okay. We have a motion to terminate debate. And we have a second. All those in, for, uh, so in favor of terminating debate on Article 30 and all matters before it, say yes. yes. All those opposed, say no. no. Debate is terminated. So let's take a vote now on the stamps amendment, which would apply that provision to two items instead of just the one, as the as the recommended vote of the ARB does. So let's switch over to a vote on the Stamps Amendment, which is the amendment itself is a majority vote. Okay. If you're in favor of the Stamps Amendment, press one for yes. If you're opposed to the Stamps Amendment, press two for no, or three to abstain. Okay, let's close voting. And the amendment passes, 185 in the affirmative, 12 in the negative, and five abstentions. So that's, that takes us to the main motion, which is a two-thirds vote. And so we're voting on the main motion, which uh, as amended by the Stamps Amendment, which would amend section 6. 111D of the zoning bylaw to require that shade trees or overhead solar panels be provided in parking lots with more than 25 spaces, um, as amended by the Stamps Amendment. So voting is now open. If you're in favor of the main motion under Article 30, as amended by the Stamps Amendment, press 1 for yes. If you're opposed, press 2 for no, or 3 to abstain. This is a two-thirds vote. The voting is closed, and the motion passes. 184 in the affirmative, 18 in the negative, one abstention, which takes us to Article 31. Uh, okay, we have a motion to adjourn. One second. Uh, uh, before we do that, Ms. Deschler. And folks, before you head out, make sure you drop off your clickers, your handsets. Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. I give notice of reconsideration on Articles 39 and 40. Okay. We have, mo we have a notice of re reconsideration for Articles 39 and 40 from Ms. Deschler. Mr. Moore? Also, also Article 40 and 20. What's that? Notice of reconsideration on 40. Okay. And also a notice of reconsideration from Mr. Moore on Article 40. Okay. And so now we have a, a motion uh, to adjourn in front of us. And I, we have a second. Second. All those in favor of adjourning, say yes. yes. All those opposed, say no. We are adjourned until Wednesday at 8 p.m., at which point we will take up the special town meeting, and I expect everyone to be on their best behavior. Thank you. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com ACMI to learn how you can help.